Uh, two announcements first. Robert Lowell's reading, which was scheduled for May 3rd, is now scheduled for May 5th in Lecture Hall 100, directly across the hall. And immediately following this reading this evening, there'll be a party open to everyone, a reception, in the Senior Commons Room, which is the faculty club here, on the second floor of the Graduate Chemistry Building, immediately following the reading. This evening, we have uh, four poets reading, and uh, have been grouped in uh, advertising as four Long Island poets. I'm always uh, wary of grouping writers together by uh, external classifications, because I don't believe that poetry is uh, determined, poetry itself is determined by either choice of habitat or a geographical accident. But what we have tonight are four unique singers of the human experience who due to either choice or accident are associated with Long Island. And as such, uh, those of us who live here precariously in Atlantic suburbia may claim a particularly warm fellow feeling with them. But it is as singers and as poets that we welcome our neighbors here tonight. Our first, the first poet is David Ignato, who recently won the 1977 Yale University Ballingen Award. And he's a poet whose work has been widely published and is a topic of a number of critical studies. His recent published verse includes selected poems, 1975, Wesleyan University Press, and Facing the Tree, 1975, Little Brown. He's been recorded by Folkways on the album Today's Poets Three, and critical studies about him have appeared in New Leader and in Salamagundi. Mr. Ignatow is a former Guggenheim Fellow, and he is a neighbor of ours by virtue of living in Jamaica. David Ignatow. snare here. I guess we need these lights hmm? in order to photograph. Uh, I notice some familiar faces in the audience and I'm asking them to forgive me for repeating poems they've heard before. I'm doing that for the sake of those who haven't heard so please bear with me. Uh, the first poem I will read has an epigraph titled, uh, an epigraph as follows. A prominent poet receives a national award for the perfect form of his poems. Hello, drug addict. Can you become a poem of perfect form? Hello, mafia. Can you become a poem of perfect form? Hello, schizoid person. Can you become a poem of perfect form? Hello, rape girl, can you become a poem of perfect form? Hello, dead napalm man, can you become a poem of perfect form? Hello, incinerated Jew, can you become a poem of perfect form? If you can't, then you don't deserve to live. You're dead, don't exist. We want clean earth, get out, get going, get lost. We have built a house for ourselves called the perfect poem, and we're trying to live in it. And if you can't take your napalm body and your drug-addicted brain and make them into a poem of perfect form, then you don't belong here. Go somewhere else. Go to Vietnam, where all the imperfect bodies are, and stay there, and don't come back to this country where only the poem of perfect form is wanted. That's all we live in. You're a foreigner, we don't want you. You're a kook, and we hate you. You're a shit, and we wipe you off the face of the earth. 
If you can't make yourself a poem of perfect form, then you have no right to be in this country. You're here without a passport. You've lost your citizenship rights. You're an alien. You're a spy. You're somebody we hate. Hello, poem of perfect form. We're home again to you, and we're going to snuggle up to you. You give us so much comfort and pleasure. We can run our hands over your darling self and feel every bit of you. It's so sensuous and delicious. It's so distracting from those bastards outside who want to disturb us with their imperfect palms. Fuck me, poem of perfect form. Let me fuck you. We'll fuck each other. We have each other, right? So let's do all the nasty things we dream about. And we'll have fun. And nobody else will know about it but you and me and me and me and me and you. Wow. I don't want to hear another word except your groans and sighs. <laughs> well, uh, that sort of states the credo in rather general outline of, of my aesthetics. <laughs> and uh, I hope it made its point. Well, the next poem is from uh, Facing the Tree. It's titled The Diner. Forgive me, please, for those who've heard it for the 50th time. But I enjoy reading it. If I order a sandwich and get a plate of ham and eggs instead, has communication broken down? Is there a chef in the house? There's no chef. I get only silence. Who brought me the ham and eggs? I was sitting at the counter when it arrived. I don't remember anyone bringing it. I'm leaving right now to find another place to eat in. A bit more congenial than this silence, with no one to witness that I ordered exactly what I say I did. But now the door is closed and I can't leave. Will someone please open the door, the one who gave me the ham and eggs instead of a sandwich? If I'm dissatisfied and want to leave, why must I stay? Can a proprietor do as he pleases with anyone on his property? Am I his property too? What do you know? I have to eat what's given me or go hungry. I have to be nice about it too and say thank you to the silence. But I want to know why I can't have what I want. That's such an innocent wish as between a sandwich and a plate of ham and eggs. What have I said? Or did I say what I thought I did? Or am I in my own country where my language is spoken? Where am I? Why can't I leave this diner? This is not my country. I don't belong here. I never even got a passport to come. I don't remember leaving. I don't remember crossing the border. And I'm the only guy here at the counter. Something phony is going on. Somebody is trying to drive me nuts or rob me or kill me. I want to go back where I came from. I was on the road hungry, driving. It was dark. And I hadn't eaten my dinner. You know, it's quite possible I made these ham and eggs myself instead of a sandwich. It may be I'm the owner because no one else is here and I have the key to open the door exactly like my car key. I must have arranged it that way. Now, when in hell did I buy this diner and who needs it? I got to try you some with something that I've uh, written more recently, and it's from a new collection. It doesn't have a title. I'm not keeping track of time precisely, but I'll do my best to stay within the period of allowed me. I sink back upon the ground, expecting to die. A voice speaks out of my ear, you are not going to die, you are being changed into a zebra. You will have black and white stripes up and down your back, and you will love people as you do not now. That is why you will be changed into a zebra that people will tame and exhibit in a zoo. You will be a favorite among children, and you will love the children in return whom you do not love now. Zookeepers will make a pet of you because of your round, sad eyes and musical bray, and you will love your keeper as you do not now. 
All is well, then, I tell myself silently, listening to the voice of my ear speak to me of my future. And what will happen to you, voice of my ear, I ask silently. And the answer comes at once. I will be your gentle musical bray that will help you as a zebra all your days. I will mediate between the world and you, and I will learn to love you as a zebra whom I did not love as a human being. This poem is, uh, is also part of the new book, I hope. It's titled South Bronx. Where am I in all this? Excuse me, but I, I do want to interrupt myself for a minute. These are all prose poems that I've been reading to you, prose poems. They differ from the organic uh, sort of poem that is still being written. Uh, here, I'm in the prose poetry. It's the uh, it's the intellect uh, playing. It's the playfulness of intellect against the playfulness of the image. South Bronx. Where am I in all this? under the heap of rubble somewhere in the middle, awaiting the nose of the rat to sniff me out and to think a moment of my human smell. The rat will find it hard to understand, back off, bare its teeth, turn tail and run. But I am nothing at all. I am refuse. I am a junk body. I cannot be repaired. I have damaged irreplaceable parts, such as eyes that refuse to see any longer turned in on themselves, my arms that stick to my sides, unable and unwilling to move, out of a lack of anything for them to do. My legs stiff and straight out before me, never having had anywhere to go, never having been put to use to walk the world. My stomach is shrunken and beyond food, because what I was served as food never really fed me but I could be useful. I am garbage, like any battered open can or empty milk carton. I want at least to be found useful by the rat to regain pride in myself before I molder into insensibility. If he hates and fears me, then it's because it was my species that hunted him at one time and forced him to eat garbage in secret humiliation. He is confusing me with my own kind, if only he would understand. But I could help by becoming unrecognizable, a pulp of flesh. Uh, I'm jumping from section to section here of the, of the new collection. And this would, is intended as the first poem of the collection new collection. It's titled Brightness as a Poignant Light. I tread the dark and my steps are silent. I am alone and feel a ghostly joy, wildly free, and yet I do not live absolutely and not forever. But my ghostly joy is that I am come to light for some reason known only to the dark, perhaps to view itself in me. As I tread the dark, led by the light of my pulsating mind, I am faithful to myself, my child. Still, how can I be happy to have been born only to return to my father, the dark, to feel his power and die? I take comfort that I am my father, speaking as a child against my fatherhood. This is the silence I hear my heart beating in, but not for me. Uh, 
the title to this one is From the Observatory. <coughs> Each step is to and from an object and does not echo in heaven or in hell. The earth vibrates under the heel or from impact of a stone. Many stones fall from outer space and earth itself is in flight. It heads out among the stars that are dead, dying or afire. I'm going to conclude by reading uh, three ritual poems. <coughs> and uh, I think that should make the entire 20 minutes that I'm being given. These are poems published in Rescue the Dead, 1968. In fact, they compose the very center and the pivot of the book itself. I should allow myself a little water. A ritual one. As I enter the theater, the play is going on. I hear the father say to the son on stage, you've taken the motor apart. The son replies, the roof is leaking. The father retorts, the tire is flat. Tiptoeing down the aisle, I find my seat, edge my way in across a dozen kneecaps as I tremble for my sanity. I have heard doomed voices calling on God, the electrode. Sure enough, as I start to sit, a scream rises from beneath me. It is one of the players. If I come down, I'll break his neck caught between the seat and the backrest. Now the audience and the play is on stage. The heads turn towards me, are waiting for the sound of the break. Must I? Those in my aisle nod slowly, reading my mind. Their eyes fixed on me, and I understand that each has done the same. Must I kill this man as the price of my admission to this play? His screams continue loud and long. I am at a loss. As to what to do, I panic, I freeze. My training has been to eat the flesh of pig. I might even have been able to slit a throat. As a child, I witnessed the dead chickens over a barrel of sawdust absorbing their blood. I then brought them in a bag to my father, who sold them across his counter. Liking him, I learned to like people and enjoy their company too, which of course brought me to this play. But how angry I become. Now everybody is shouting at me to sit down, sit down or I'll be thrown out. The father and son have stepped off stage and come striding down the aisle side by side. They reach me, grab me by the shoulder and force me down. I scream, I scream as if to cover the sound of the neck breaking. All through the play I scream and I'm invited on stage to take a bow. I lose my senses and kick the actors in the teeth. There is more laughter, and the actors acknowledge my performance with a bow. How should I understand this? Is it to say that if I machine gun the theater from left to right, they will respond with applause that would only gradually diminish with each death? I wonder then whether logically I should kill myself too out of admiration. A question indeed, as I return to my seat and observe a new act of children playfully aiming their kicks at each other's groins. Ritual two. The kids yell and paint their bodies black and brown, their eyes bulging. As they brush, they dance, weaving contorted shapes. They drive each other to the wall, to the floor, to the bed, to the john, yelling nothing. 
Now they race around in a circle, pounding their bellies, and laughter rises from among them. They begin to take the stage apart on which they stand, ripping, kicking, and pounding. I show them my palm, the cavity of my mouth, down to my larynx, and then, as I begin my own dance, it ends when I die. They lock hands and circle around me, very glad, very confident, for the circle shall be empty of me, and they, falling through the stage, will yell, nothing. I remove hat, coat, shoes, socks, pants, and undershirt. I make motions to the ceiling to come down and make motions to the floor to open. I pretend to write a check for all my money and hand it around. Each refuses to take it and continues to dance. I give the check to a hand that reaches from the ceiling as the kids chant, nothing, nothing. I pretend to hold the child by the hand and walk as though strolling up a street with him and stoop to listen to this child and talk to him. When suddenly I act as if shot, slowly falling to the ground, kissing the child goodbye with my fingertips. But I spring up and pretend to be the child, lost, abandoned, bewildered, wanting to die, crouching as the circle keeps chanting, nothing, nothing. I then rise slowly to my full height, having grown up through my agony. I throw my head back proudly and join hands with others as they dance, chanting their theme. We converge in the center, bang against each other, scream and scatter. <clears throat> Ritual three has an epigraph. In England, the slow, methodical torture of two children was recorded on tape by the murderers. You may have recalled that murder on the moors years ago. Well, it's in two parts. It's quiet for me now that I have buried the child. I am resting, rid of a menace to my peace since I am not here for long either. What she said was that she wanted to go back to her mother, so help her God, and I believed her. And they did too, who cut her slowly into flesh. But it was another mother they had in mind. Let me rest, let me rest from their mistakes. They were human like myself, somehow gone in a direction to a depth I've never known. I am not thinking. I am contemptuous of thought. I growl in my depth. I find blood flowing across my tongue and enjoy its taste. Call me man. I don't care. I am content with myself. I have a brain that gives me the pleasure. Come here, and I will tear you to pieces. It'll be catch as catch can. But I can throw you who are weakened with the horror of what I say. So surrender peacefully, and let me take my first bite directly above your heart. I am a man your life lost in feeling. I never knew what mercy meant. I am free. Two. Child gone to a calm grave. I want to be a crocodile, opening the two blades of my mouth. I'll slide through swamp, taking in small fish and flies. I will not run a knife across the skin, or cut off a nose, or tear off the genitals as screams fade in exhaustion. Nobody could force me as I threaten with my jaws, safe for a moment as I dream I am sane, purposeful and on my course, dreaming that we no longer should trouble to live as human beings, that we should discuss this, putting aside our wives and children, for to live is to act in terms of death. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ignato. Alan Plants uh, comes to us this evening from the other end of the island, the eastern end from East Hampton. Mr. Plants, 1969-1970, was poetry editor of The Nation. He is the author of Poor White and Other Poems, 1964, Stud Song, 
1968, A Night for Rioting, 1969, Wildcraft, 1975, Chanarhara, 1977, Alan Plants. I, I too have to say with David, uh, some of you will have to be patient with rereading poems I've written often before. <clears throat> uh, I, uh, I am a part-time, sometime half-ass fisherman, uh, and, uh, as well as a writer, and I write often about the sea, but I am also a city boy, born in Manhattan and raised for the most part there. So I read poems, I write poems uh, about the sea, and the city. So I'd like to switch back and forth between them. It's called osprey. Ospreys are those large sea hawks that uh, were nearly decimated to extinction during the 60s because of the DDT in their eggs. They are on their way back. However, the poem. <clears throat> Osprey. Once lying all night in the warm body of fog, together in the dawn, we felt a fault of silver open on the shore. We dove and reared in flurries the tide ringed and raced away as our dream of dolphins left us shining by a star suffering its birth offshore. Hearing a cry, a shiver deflected underwater, we looked up to see two ospreys freewheeling down the dawn. In the enduring fullness of ecstasy, we glimpsed only in the beauty of each other coursing currents, upswelling to that light. I think of the men I work with, artists able to get along only by hustling their skills to the rich. Having found the land again, they try, dreaming it whole, and always at the splendid parties, they stare past you at the sea. They grow old gently. Their women are transient. Their half-remembered children live in distant cities. Once in a while, high in a seaside villa, the rich view their bone-breaking, impoverished art and say, dig it. The otter dives, but the osprey never misses. I wrote that and lied. They miss terrifically, wing over tail hurtling, to rise sopped in foam, limping for power on strange, astonished cries. Now, drunk on DDT, they disappear from the coves and estuaries where they climbed the dawn first and hovered, trembling for the stoop or hunched and hissed if I came near their eggs, from whose thin shell the beaked and hooded creature would not stir ever. There's not enough light, but still drunk, I get up anyhow and go to sea. Black skimmers start homing in, gulls flap and gawk, the tide turns against itself, sighing. Then I hear a familiar cry, and no, I am not awake. And still straining for dawn, I hear high overhead, wings echoing unfathomably, down rift and reef, a shadow moving on the continent. And I feel hearts more perfect than my own, resound the sheer coastwise tremor of a star. And I wake and die and breathe again. Within the song, a girl sings to herself, thigh deep in a summer sea. When a man dies, a bird is born underwater, only a wing at first, circling a tide rip, then faster until it breaks free of the sea, a fierce bird pursuing a cry into the northeast wind. But when a bird dies, lies, lies, the Suffolk County Mosquito Control Commission spraying poison once only to control mosquitoes and the rich only their homes and their lives ordered like great art. 
and Mike Wright, painter, only to sketch the birds that flee him in the salt marsh. And I only want to fly underwater, fainting backward through a wound. And a girl only to be awakened at dawn, to swim out through fog of brightening each instant, and see the ospreys in their dalliance soar in the sun, overflowing the North Atlantic, hawk's eye and hawk's heart. City poem. Now somebody asked me to read this. <clears throat> it's a little different. That heavy. It's called A Piece of the Action. You ever ride the subways in New York? <clears throat> well, something like this will happen to you. Sometime, if you're right. Riding the IRT uptown, I saw a masher coming down. Well, what do I call this guy, the hulk of him two seats wide, who in the nearly empty car plumps down next to a schoolgirl, sprawls against her, and grins into his newspaper? The act, so open, the girl's body suddenly tense, her face coming up, startled, divining. She shifts. He shifts. I frown, and he grins back at me, not challenging, but welcoming me to his pleasure. A freak, a sadist, a dirty prick. God damn it, why doesn't she get up? But just keep staring away, acknowledging neither of us. Shall I say, miss, is this man bothering you? Or, hey man, cut that shit out. And if he still grins, go for him fast, so he can't get to his feet. I realize that would be a pleasure, though old-fashioned. But what's his? Does he jack off later, remembering the warmth and curve against him, and climax yelling, hot dog, or murmuring, Isobel, or whispering, mama, or moo moo? Or well, where's his other hand now? Maybe he's, no, he's reading his newspaper, still grinning. And the girl drops her eyes to her book, her hair falls forward around her face, and slouching a little, she smiles to herself. Smiles. By this time, though it's none of my business, I'm feeling left out. Like the time the girl, two girls I brought home started making it with each other. And the time when at a conventional party, Joe grinned deliriously and said, I'm an armpit man myself. So I, so I cross my legs and start smiling, the three of us smiling, to see what else is up, uptown, downtown, all around the town, sometime after the sexual revolution. Uh, to go back to the sea, yeah, let me read you another one. Uh, Fall to shore. I give the blue fog I've slept in to the first being I meet, a woman sleeping in the surf of dreams. The night heron calls the west moon from the corner of my eye. I step back twice, and with my one good arm, let loose the hammerhead screwing in the otter troll. Fire drake of the glacial pit, Grief mistress of the conjured twilight, I take back my love of land, lost when I first read these waters, covered variously with the pale luminescence of my fever. I was hidden in the things I sought beneath it. No matter, we have risen and gone swimming and singing together. Now I want to sit and think about it. I want to hunker down and listen to her. I want to hear her whole in a sway of feathers, a swell of fog, when the wind is east and gusting, and I feel beyond my skin the other end of dreaming, falling moment to moment to the shape of the sea. The last book is uh, Chandahara, published by Street Press, just coming out. Right? Right. <laughs> just coming out. I said, right. Yeah. Northwest woods, that's where the woods I live in, which are uh, swiftly becoming suburbanized. I wake up brimming, 
Wind backing out of the east keeps me from the sea today, so I go into the forest. Junk is everywhere. Cars, washing machines, chairs. All over America, people dump in forests. Sanitary landfills close too early for those who must ride their garbage out after dark. Suddenly, the cut over woods deepen. The wind rises, and I hear it beginning another, rarer sound. I plunge into a stand of white pines. Never logged, their straight trunks soar like mast, masts men chop down the whole northeast for. Now the age of sail is over. These trees voyage on. Their destiny, stronger than any mate can will them, any men can will them by throwing junk in their groves. I look back up at the slope. Hundreds of feet above me, the tapering tops catch the sun, and I hear a cry, beauty, you are my peace and freedom. It is myself overflowing. City poem, encore. <clears throat> there are silences, so awful, nobody survives the winter night past 12, when the skeleton of a wind gust retorks a tenement, and all that once stood upright gets juiced, knowing it's time to depart, you know, with the lower, with the lower music of the lower me side, resists the cold, and so many bodies tremble in the dialect of its downfall. Here's Alan Plans talking his goddamned head off, saying, once I was a man, screw it all, saying, there went the 60s, wild hearts of my generation, saying, there went my tribe, there went the revolution. I speak of the jazz poets, not the leaders or the Michaels. I mean those who didn't write about it, who talked all day and all night at the riots and the rallies, but who didn't nail it down, who ate death for a decade and went out with it, their lives laid down on the line between this silence and that wind of the Americas, drunks and junkies call the hawk. Aftercare. This is about uh, pills I found in the dump. And it's a true story again. Pills I found in the dump. Somebody had discharged this guy from Pilgrim State and on, on the set you gave him 10 bottles of all the of, of terrible pills. Uh, all, oh, and they were all dated to be taken the same day. Aftercare. William Breton's any, any uh, coincidence with persons living alive or in here is disclaimed. <clears throat> William Breton's either dead or drunk. Last week at the dump, I found the pil pills Pilgrim State discharged him with. Thorazine, Milleril, Norparamine, Isionide, Myambutol, Antiabuse. Each, the label says, to be taken daily. Letting him go, Dr. Thomas gave him a blessing. Twelve pills a day, William, to keep you straight and feeling groovy, if at all cheaper than drinking, but you chucked it away, and I choose to believe you chose freedom. Why else should this stuff be thrown out when it could be peddled for port? You may be dead or drunk, Willie, but as the Isionide comes thundering on the Millerill, my buddies and I call out the odds you're beating. Debate whose care, wipes or barkeeps you're wobbling from. Drink to the fate you fight alone, maybe drunk, but not drugged. No, what uh, I got, by my calculations, I got about five minutes, four minutes. Hmm. I like to, since it's spring, I wrote this poem in the spring, I'd like to read you just a few parts. They're very impressionistic. Uh, of a long poem called The Tide for Wilderness. Wind backing into the southwest burrs new buds of the basswood. Deer faint forward to the edge of the swamp. Fog dogs brightening, spring vanishing, 
In the hour before sunrise, April through June, I wander in a bird song. The wind stops at the nearest tree, as if waiting to speak. A tree toad shifts its grip, wide awake. The stump of a leg is barred to the skies. Order bodies roll and surf. In gunkos, ooze pushes forth a creamy froth. The hackle head's core will sound from on warm spring nights. I step into the canoe of moonrise and my shadow furs with filings racing from the northern lights. I step into a willow and shiver. Wind awakening a girl's body before dawn in the purple space warp, returning a gull or girl whispering at the end of song, the lightful dawn song. <clears throat> White-throated sparrow upswelling at field edge in the steep of the wave, sleep, sleep, seas. It goes on for quite a bit more, but that's just the beginning. Hmm? To finish, I'll read you the title poem. Uh, it's called A Ground Like a Shore Before. Chandahar is the name of my boat. Uh, it's the mating cry of the Sandwich Islanders. <laughs> it's also the name the uh, Australian Aborigines gave to the English boats. Chandra means to, uh, to puke, and Hara means stomach, and they call them puke boats. <clears throat> it's called a ground, and it has, only a, it has an epitaph. This world in which man desperately needs to make panic look like reason. So Becker. Running a ground, I, I often run a ground. Uh, and uh, it's not fun, as you'll find out. <clears throat> Between this wave breaking and the next, I've got to get the bow around or be taken. Slammed with the boat into breakwater, shock on shock on a granite rocked shoal. For hours I've dreaded one wave in a thousand, now one in twelve that will climb over the backs of its forebearers, gain speed and come green to the hull rearing up the sky. Explode, damascene, multifoliate, over us both. Trouble starts in threes, Thaloka dose. I've jerked off nights, laughing with death in the cockpit, who can't fish but buys all I catch, though seasick, unable to hold it, upchucking squirrel tails of foam that whip astern. Anyhow, I've stood four square with this one, fish thrashing between us, their last meal backing out of their mouths, alive. Strike on the port side, death in the cockpit, Strike on the starboard. Broach, pitch pole, turn turtle. If not dead when the worst happens, alone at sea, I get nine seconds to die or whole ass. Once I fell out at full speed and once flipped over. What's worse, I still wonder, was it luck, grace, instinct? I've come close enough to drowning to know it'll be easy with ground swells collapsing above me and me just not knowing which ways up. The fear of fog I've lost since I last caught it in sleep and locked its vapor in my thighs. But not of white water foam, nothing can sleep or swim in. We must die, Chandahara, but not this way. So we are leaping the wave crests, porpoising, heaving and hauling and clearing the shoal. The ignition fires and I come out planning nine seconds or twelve, no matter but for this. I bang for the shore and our power swelled till I've ranged the set, compacted in tow behind. This is the ride called shaking the bells, sledding the waves. And this is the telling when shore water thins to a terror line, syllables drifting over the tongue, trouble coming in X's. My boat stud song, symbolic logic, duende. No blame when water comes over the head. I fear panic worse than a diver with a leak pelleting his lungs, not daring to choke or cough, and so almost breathing water. Blacking out, whiting out, passing over. 
In sleep, the riff plays out the dream. Mate and slay, laugh and feast. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Plans. Claire White, uh, whose artistic interests include art, dance, and playwriting, is a widely published poet, novelist, short story writer, and essayist. Also, over the 10 years' time that I've been associated with Stony Brook, Claire White and her husband, Robert, have maintained a refuge for uh, artists, writers, sculptors, painters, musicians, whatever, in their house and barns that uh, has fed and given solace and encouragement to an counted number of creative people. Her poems have appeared in Harper's, Atlantic, Saturday Review, and various poetry magazines. She is listed in the Directory of American Poets and is funded by Poets and Writers, New York State Council on the Arts. Her novel, the Death of the Orange Trees was published by Harper and Row in 1963. And her play, William in Exile, will be performed at the end of May by the Community Free Theater in St. James. Claire White. I'll start with a poem called Orient Point. Uh, I wrote it after taking my youngest son to the ferry to go off to school. The stones on the beach bone white, and the sun turning the corner of the island where it ends. Space. I wave and cry because it is finished, the land and the summer. The ship leaves. Old couples sit against the sky, fat and clean, talking to dogs. Perhaps I am old, left on the shore. But these ominous butterflies gathering, orange art nouveau, attack the windshields of the aged who drive back slowly to their condominiums. Um, this poem, All Souls Day on Long Island, is written really about my husband's grandmother called Bessie Smith. Uh, Bill Hayne has written about Richard Bullsmith, but I married his descendant, so um, it's a kind of competition. <laughs> um, she, um, I was a refugee when I first met her, when I first came to Long Island, and felt very rootless, but when I saw her, she seemed to have such roots that I felt I could graft onto them. This is the time again when those that wear return and do not greet us and go about their work with the authority of precedence and age. We are mere ghosts of those who came before, who bartered not their land as we our loves and knew the worth of being planted here. Ah, were we but the roots of such a tree and not the leaves that glitter, fall, and die? We multiplied and drowned. Triumphantly, Aunt Bessie stalks along the bluffs. The sound, a soft silk scarf of blue lined with a strip of taupe, the faded sand. I see her wave her cane to chase the gulls to poke the clams. She picks the beach plums, which are hard and sour. She conjures up her woods, her wilderness, and fallow fields with purple weeds that roll down to the brackish rivers, inlets, ponds, where the blue heron with folded foot long stands, and shrieking pheasants rise, and wild geese fall in linear patterns. Wearing mended gloves, and a red woolen dress she shares with the moths rises Aunt Bessie, autocratic and strong. As far as she can see, the land is hers. 
I am, I am, she cries and knocks her cane on the dull ground and smiles with innocence. Come, walk along the roads, dispel the ghosts along Shep Jones's lane, Three Sisters Road from Smithtown to St. James to Stony Brook of glaring, glossy, brittle little homes that litter the once steaming furrowed field. Then let me meet you there, and we shall try to see it as the mounts painted it once, with an erasing eye and lying hand, till under tangled poison ivy vines we'll hear the Indian heartbeat in the shade, where unshot feet left not a trace behind. This is a poem I'll dedicate to Jerry because it's about a dog which he very kindly took care of for a whole year. The dog is called Ilya. Um, that was the time of Ilya Kuryakin. I don't know if you remember that TV show. I never did like dogs. I have a dog I like. I am monodogus. His libido is small. With balls like horse turds, he is celebitous. Supercilious cur appearing at my door wearing a meager fur. If dog I must, I do. If dog, it shall be you with the molasses eyes. My psychic animal, like an Aeolian harp, you quiver when I dream. Then draw me down the path with your antenna tail to brave the world at large, which likes you not at all. Your bark is worth their bite, I say. It serves them right, as well as any man when armed with you I fare. My dog is my affair. This is um, called The Fisherman, with apologies to Mr. Plants. I'm not a very technical fisherman, but I have fished on St. James Harbor. It is also a love poem. Fishermen bob on the water's lap, their patient lines sounding the deep. Then, miraculous encounter, a mouth meets a hook in the darkness. By divine intervention, the two connect. The fisherman, struck by the electrical current of the live object, hauls it out, is increased by it, and absorbs the separate. Oh, fish, fish, I am one of you. May the one I long for cast me a strong hook and haul me to him in a silver sweep through the air, tearing a wound in my throat so deep that I shall be silenced, squeezing the flat, slippery life out of my harnessed self. Only his pleasure remains. This is a poem about my Dutch grandmother, who I called Bomma. I lived in the, on the, in the Rhine Valley, and we spoke a sort of a dialect. Bomma obviously is a mixture of Bon Mama and Oma. She always wore black dresses, their panels closed with snaps. Her skin was soft as that of cat's ears inside out. When she cut cloth with scissors, her jaw moved up and down. Shadow in which I hid, she sat close to the stove. Its door of eyes and glass grew red as the wind rose. I learned to lick her thread to pass through needle's eyes. My sight was hers, and she laughed inward like a dove. Who says that she was sad? I caught her on the stairs the first day of the year and wished such merriment, her laughter mixed with tears. Her children stalked above with thunder in their beards, but she and I were short and passed below their belts. Her heart had a red glow, my bomber of the stove. It was so long ago. Did I invent her love? Besides living on Long Island, I've also lived four years in Rome. 
at the acad academy in Rome, where my husband had a fellowship. This, um, the last time we were there, Rome struck me as a very barbaric place. And this is a poem which is really a list of all the churches dedicated to Mary. I seem to write a lot about matriarchs, and Mary becomes a kind of matriarch. Mary's part, it's called Reluctant Litany. Mary's parlors glow with golden knickknacks. Welcome, she says, a perfect hostess. Mary in the garden, on the road, on the hill, over the bridge, across the Tiber, in the chapel, on the stairs, of the angels, of the soul, of the people, the ancient, the new, the Egyptian, the trivial, the major. Which of them has the power to mend a kidney, a shin bone, or a stone heart? Mary of the well, the snows, the sun, the painted caves, the ship, the fevers, the furnaces, the tears, the seven dolors. A glittering sword pierces the voluptuous sheath of her heart. She thrones marble skulled in black velvet and gold. Mary of a good death, how mourning becomes a spider eyeing its prey. Then, transfigured, triumphant, victorious, of peace, liberator, the glorious, inevitable Mary, in spite of everything, pray for us. The next poem, um, I'll read parts of it. It's a long series of poems called Biography, 1957-1975. And it's about my daughter, my youngest daughter, Natalie, who died in a car accident, as much too many young people do in suburbia. In a still hospital ward, the time was determined when her travails would begin to the sound of her father reading aloud from the old curiosity shop about little Nell and the old man wandering out in the night. Natalie, Natalie named because, thank God, she was born late a September night, whereas little Nell wanders on out there where the weather is wild in a book with dry pages. The good witch slept on the couch and peed in a coffee can. The bad witch cursed and swore standing outside the door and said, I want to kill it. Both were dark, actually, with white faces. Frail because hardly begun, the small life could be sniffed out by a pillow or a cat. The house was its iron lung. The sentinels tiptoed their rounds. Survive, survive, breathed the chairs. Doors leaned against silence. The roof spread its wings. Time swelled in the rooms. Improbably it grew, this creature menaced by a disturbing weight in the air. And the mother had milk for two. This was the luxury child, sat on the parlor floor in pink embroidery, in woolly knitted net. Center of gravity behind the climbing hedges, they made it a cart of wood, they dragged it through the field. Queen, they called it, gold sprouted from its head, lit by the sun, dainty darling of all their games. They gave it funny names, Natty Puss, Natty McNatty, and it was spoiled with life. Cool wrist, thin bone, index and thumb can hold you home. The arm too small for the sleeve hole, a fragile crease where neck and chin begin. The greedy dreams that play about lips' white outline. The frail design of down and mole. Longing to kiss, I peek too close to see the hole. The hollow back thin chrysalis. Sharp shoulder blades of budding wings. The long flat bodice, buttoned, neat. 
forks into vibrant legs and feet. The eyes that tug away, away, I let you loose on the green day. In the blue caverns of the shade, hover my hanging, hummingbird. Through a Roman street where priest's robes are sold and the rain clatters down, in a gray coat with a fur piece, walks a creature I know, with an appetite for jelly rolls and puffs filled with zabayon, Christmas decorations with gold sequins, hair ribbons and notebooks covered in Florentine paper, crumpets in English tea rooms, and dances to avant-garde music, which make her squirm like an insect. Churches where saints with peculiar habits inhabit intricate spaces. Endless her longings, but them time is a promise just entered, a catalogue high as a tower, a Vatican filled with desire. Such comfort in the rooms that she inhabited. Visiting cards were left and reticules with scent. Cats purred and dogs dreamed and knitting needles talked of tea and plants went wild with indoor energy. And where she sat, like stone, the stillness held its breath. And where she held her peace, her concentrated skills filled every inch of space. She played Victorian games. She drew them in her book. She wore her crinoline one last day in July and bowed herself goodbye. But the last dress she made was gray, the shade of ashes fitting the occasion. Beads of plain wood like teeth encircled her long neck. She ate with head bowed. We sat in Trinity, summer in our cups, birds about the door. She dove into the green. I never said goodbye. A car slid out of sight. The beads alone returned, but the string had snapped. Police are scrupulous at times. I don't know what happened on the highway while I wandered on the beach like a bird. I ordered tea with muffins. I was rearranging words. I drove into town for a long hook to fasten a window to a sill. A hook such as I remembered from what she called olden days. Such hooks are amazingly rare now. I traveled from store to store, hooked onto my silly distraction. I prolonged by three hours or more the life, or rather the notion of her life, in my head like an egg. Whatever occurred on the highway, it snapped her elegant neck.